do you choose between a sensible purchase and a fun purchase? On the one hand, life is short and it's yours to live, but on the other, you don't want to make a rash decision that could cost you money in the long run. If that sounds familiar, then the bad news is, is that it also applies to car buying as well. The good news, though, is that some cars, such as this Cupra Leon Estate, promise to offer you the best of both worlds. For those that don't know, Cupra is the spin-off performance brand of the Spanish manufacturer Seat. So while the car you're seeing on your screen now looks an awful lot like a Seat Leon Estate, it is in fact a Cupra. And you can tell is from the badge and the fetching bronze detailing around the car. So what does the Cupra Leon Estate do? Well, just like the VW Golf R and Skoda Octavia VRS estate models, it is a sensible, practical family estate car that happens to be very, very fast indeed. I mean, I should know because I've been running this exact car for the last five months now. And in the next few minutes, I'm gonna tell you all the things I like about it, all the things I don't like, and whether it's worth its near 40,000 pound asking price. The Cupra Leon Estate is available with two petrol engines. There's the 310 horsepower 2 litre four cylinder model that we're reviewing here, and there's also a 1.4 litre plug in hybrid version that comes with a 13 kilowatt battery. When fully charged, it'll produce 245 horsepower and around 30 all electric miles of range. However, when the battery gets depleted, your 0 to 62 mile an hour times and average fuel consumption figures will increase significantly. So as I explained in the intro, I've been running this car for over five months, so I reckon I know the interior back to front by now, and there are plenty of good points about it. It looks very similar to a regular Seat Leon interior, but there are some nice things to differentiate it. So you've got the bronze detailing spread around the cabin, but you've also got this steering wheel, which reminds me of one from an Audi R8, mainly because of these buttons down here. So you've got the engine start stop button, just how it is in an Audi R8. And you've also got a shortcut to the drive modes, which is actually really, really handy if you just want to quickly switch through them. The seats on this VZ2 spec car, they're the sports bucket seats. They're nice and comfortable. They've got enough adjustment. I've heard some people say they can be a little bit tight just around here, the bolsters, but I find them very comfortable and they keep you in place well. You can get heated leather and electrically adjustable seats, but you need to pay more for the VZ3 trim. And honestly, although these could be heated, I actually think they're really good seats. Storage space in here is also really good. We've got a decent sized glove box where you can put lots of things in there. We've got the center armrest, which is again, quite deep storage space under there. There's a cup holder, two cup holders here, one for a large cup, one for a small cup. We've got these little inlets either side of this tiny, tiny gear lever, which you can put some coins or the keys in, for example. There's a place for your phone ahead of that with two USB-C charging points. And if you go for the VZ3 spec, you get a wireless charging pad there as well. Now, one rather important thing that I'm less a fan of in this interior is the infotainment system. Every version of the Cupra Leon Estate gets a 10 inch central touchscreen with a system that looks on the face of it like it has all the features you could ever need. And actually the graphics look nice and it does the job when you're just casually looking at it. But having lived with this car for a while now, I've got to say it can crash just randomly. It can be very slow to respond if it's been left dormant for a while. And there's some weird quirks in the way that it's been programmed that makes me feel like it was a little bit rushed. As I said, the graphics are good, the functionality is good, and for a lot of the time it does work well, but it's just that inconsistency which can be frustrating. You've also got something where the climate control settings are controlled via these touch buttons underneath the central screen. And although that looks fine, again, on the face of it, it's only when you drive this car at night 
but you realize that they don't actually light up so you can't see where the blue and the red is so you can't see which button makes it cooler and which button makes it hotter so you're kind of fumbling around looking for those climate control buttons and it feels like it would have been a really easy fix but for some reason they didn't do it which is a shame and I've got to say that when I ran a 2017 Seat Leon Cupra estate car before it became the Cupra badge, the infotainment system was a highlight. It was very simple to use, nothing fancy, but it did its job, it was consistent, and you had those physical climate control dials. And that just felt like a more polished package than what we've got here. One thing I didn't have though on my 2017 Cupra was this digital dashboard display. So I'm quite a fan of this. It replaces traditional dials and instead you've got a screen in front of you which gives you all the information you could possibly need. And what's more, you can customize it pretty much until your heart's content. So you can go through various different screens and displays for how you want the information shown. And you can also then customize those individual displays using the little panels on the left and the right. So you can see all the information you want or as little information as you want. It's actually a really nice digital dash and not every manufacturer gets this right, but Cupra has done a really, really good job with that. So top marks for the digital dash, less keen on the infotainment system. Standard equipment on the Cupra Leon estate is pretty extensive and includes the aforementioned touchscreen and digital dash, Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, a rear view camera, ambient lighting and four switchable driving modes. This particular car comes with the optional magnetic grey paint and tow bar pre-installation with a built-in hook. When it comes to rear seat space, the Cooper Leon Estate isn't actually that far behind the class-leading Skoda Octavia Estate VRS because you've got plenty of knee room, you've got plenty of leg room, lots of headroom as well, and it generally feels nice and light and airy back here. You will probably struggle to get three adults across the back, although you could do it for a short journey. The main reason for that is this big chunky central transmission tunnel, but then that's not really different to any of this car's arrivals, so no complaints there. Um, you get a separate climate control zone back here, but you can lock that so the kids can't stop messing with it. You also get two USB-C charging points. You get isofix points on the outer rear seats and on the passenger seat and also a door which opens fairly wide so you can get that child seat in easily. As for boot space, the Leon Estate is competitive with rivals, offering 620 litres of capacity. Although it's worth noting that this drops to 470 litres if you have the plug-in hybrid variant. Handy pockets sit on either side of the main load bay and a sliding tonneau cover is included to aid privacy. Before I talk to you about how the Cooper Leon Estate drives, I'm going to give you three alternatives that you can buy and run for a vaguely similar amount of money. First up is the VW Golf R Estate. It hasn't been launched at the time of filming, but rest assured that the wagon version of this hugely popular hot hatch is a great alternative to the Leon. Meanwhile, if you want something a little bigger, the Skoda Octavia Estate VRS will do the job perfectly. And if you really are looking for something different, then take a look at the Cupra Formentor SUV, as it uses the same running gear as the Leon. So why would you spend all that extra money on a Cupra Leon rather than a Seat Leon? Well, a lot of the answer surely is that you want it to be fast and fun to drive. And thankfully, this is. I'll start with the engine and it's a two litre, 310 horsepower, four cylinder turbocharged petrol. And together with the seven speed DSG gearbox, it absolutely flies along. I mean, naught to 62 miles an hour in 4.9 seconds and it feels it. In fact, it feels even quicker. There's power low down in the rev range, there's power in the mid range, and there's even plenty of grunt at the top end, which you might not expect from a turbocharged engine, but this really goes. I mean, overtaking is effortless, and because of that all-wheel drive system, it doesn't matter what the conditions are, you can always put that power down. Even if it's slippery or greasy, it just puts it down with zero fuss. 
through the corners, I'd say it's not quite as sharp as the hatchback version because you have got that big bit out back which adds on a little bit of extra weight and it also makes the car a little bit more cumbersome but it still changes direction admirably and you can really get some nice amount of movement on the brakes so you can turn in and really enjoy the car on a good road. I mean I would say that the brake pedal could be a little bit firmer maybe and you could have a little bit better body control but having said earlier that I ran a 2017 say at Leon Cooper Estate, this is definitely an improvement. It feels more agile, it feels more willing to dart through the corners. I mean, honestly, you feel pretty unstoppable in this thing because it is just so unshakable, but it's still good fun. Now, of course, in everyday driving, which is probably what you'll spend most of your time doing, even with the best will in the world, you'll probably want to switch the drive modes into either the comfort setting or what I've got it in now, which is the individual setting. And the reason I have it in individual is because you can have the adaptive dampers, which are standard on the estate version of the Cooper Leon. You can have them in the softest setting, so the best ride, but you can have the engine in a slightly sportier setting and the gearbox in a sportier setting and also the exhaust in a sportier setting. So the car feels a bit more perky than it would in the comfort mode where it can be a little bit lazy when you're just trying to zip away from the lights. And of course, you've also got a full on Cooper mode, which puts everything in the craziest setting. But I think that individual, it just gives you a nice little halfway house between full on comfort and full on Cooper for everyday driving. I mean, on these 19 inch alloy wheels, the ride comfort is pretty good. It's not perfect. It could be a bit more polished, especially over expansion joints where it does seem to crash through them sometimes. But, you know, 90% of the time, it's a good ride quality. It doesn't feel too fussy. And overall, it works well with the amount of refinement you get, which again is pretty good. You can start to hear more wind noise at higher speeds, but nothing to stop you from feeling relaxed in this car, which I usually do until you put it in some of the sportier modes. On the whole, this is a very easy car to drive. It's not too wide. You've got really good visibility. There's power when you want it. There's fuel economy when you don't need it. I mean, a long-term average in this, I'm getting about 35 miles per gallon, but I have seen well over 40 into mid 40s on a longer run. So it can be economical. The only real downside to the driving experience, in my view, is some of the driver assistance systems because the lane guidance or the lane departure warning, you have to turn it off every time you turn the car on. It won't just save as being off. And trust me, you'll want it off because it is so overzealous in how it polices where you are on the road. Going down a country road is such a pain in the arse and you just want to turn it off, but it never stays off. So you have to do that at the start of every journey. And when you do that, the digital dash display it always then defaults to the driver assistance screen, which isn't probably what you wanted or what you had it on. So that's a bit of a weird thing. And it goes back to the quirks that seem a bit strange I mentioned with the infotainment system, because no idea why it does that. Um, also, the autonomous emergency braking, obviously every car has that now. I've noticed it do some phantom braking from time to time. So only at low speeds, but it slammed the anchors on for no apparent reason. Again, it's not the only car to do that. I have driven other cars to do it, but just be aware of it because it can be quite frightening and it can catch out the people behind you, obviously. But actually, I'm not against all of the driver assistance tech because the blind spot monitoring is really useful. Not least because the mirrors could probably be a bit bigger for a car of this size, but also because the lights are really nicely integrated into the doors. So you get a nice orange light, which tells you when there's a car in the blind spot, and that's super useful. If you're looking to buy a Cooper Lay on Estate, but you're not sure which one to go for, then here's my top three choices. For the cheapest one available, it's the VZ2 Spec E-Hybrid model. If you're a company car driver, then again, get the E-Hybrid in either VZ2 or VZ3 Spec, doesn't matter. And if you want the fastest one, then get this, the four-cylinder, two-litre, 310 horsepower turbocharged petrol version. 
for those that need to roll practicality and performance into a single car, the Cuprolet on estate is right up there with the best of them for around £40,000. Not only does it drive and perform well, it also provides an intriguing and, to these eyes, more stylish alternative to the upcoming VW Golf R estate. As I said earlier, it's only the inconsistent infotainment system which frustrates me about this car, especially because it was so good in the previous Seat Leon Cupra. And I have to wonder if I'd have only driven this car for a week and reviewed it over a week, would it have annoyed me more? However, having used this car for the last few months, I can recognize that the infotainment is only a part of what is otherwise a very, very good package and one that I'd recommend without much hesitation. It's fun, it's fast, it's practical, it's well equipped, and it's also quite comfortable. For the most part, it does offer the best of both worlds. And for this kind of money, I think that's a pretty good deal.